today on Lightning Bugs. So do you have any theories on uh, on your own creativity or in creativity in general, or do you just do what you do and try not to analyze these things? So I think creativity is often, for me, locked in with spans of attention. Mm-hmm. And if I can hold my attention with a creative project for a long time, then I'm better off. So when my attention span gets shorter, that's when I think I lose some element of creativity because I lose my patience. TikTok is a good format because it allows you to put forth a concise idea, like a standalone idea that is, um, you know, it's almost like um, radio, like pop songs on the radio. It's like, it's gotta be like three minutes. You know, that's as long as you can go on TikTok. So it's like gotta be usually less than that. And so what you're also doing is you're introducing yourself to an audience that may have no idea of your other work. So you wanna sort of bring forth a, a snippet of what you do. I feel like technology and engaging in this new technology keeps me young or young minded. And I'd like to stay that way. I'd like to stay sort of youthful. And I think rock and roll is all about that too. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Welcome back to another episode of Lightning Bugs. My guest today is Margaret Cho. Mohran Cho, I think is how you pronounce it. Mohran. Mohran, yes. Very good. Yes, very good. As a trailblazing comedian, actress, musician, and activist, Margaret has five Grammy Award nominations and one Emmy nod for her groundbreaking work, What's a, what's a nod mean, do you think? I think it's another nomination. It's another <laughs> nomination. It's a nom. Another Emmy nom for her groundbreaking work on the hit TV series 30 Rock. Those are great. Margaret makes it a priority to support the causes that are important to her, anti-racism, anti-bullying, gay rights, all while fulfilling her successful creative side with her legendary stand-up career that has yielded 10-plus comedy tours, television appearances, podcasting, and film. To be clear, there are more than 10 plus television appearances or podcasts. (laughs) Rolling Stone magazine named Margaret one of the 50 best stand-up comics, calling her, quote, the sort of funny, sex-positive feminist and LGBT activist younger comics continue to look up to. Uh, Now, uh, before we start, I'd like to play a clip from a song. This is a song which catapulted Margaret into fame. Roll it. And they knew, but I didn't know And now I digress Can you digress if you have not yet grasped? There you go Masterpiece So without (laughs) further ado, Margaret Cho Yay! you i saw you at that event and you know who else was in the audience um ivanka trump do you remember that ivanka and jared oh yes that's right because you saw her and jared and then you you looked white as a ghost for a couple minutes i was so scared because um they were uh passing underneath the uh, kennedy center they were coming in and i was so scared i really i held my breath and then they were sitting in the front row. Well, that's a weird thing to, 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 to do. I regularly do DC at the Kennedy Center. And yeah, it's, it's a revolving door of people like that. It can be really, um, you don't think they're real people. I mean, I know that like movie stars and stuff are real people. That's easy enough. You meet them. But mm-hmm. something about seeing the news figures like that is, is super weird when they're, that, when they're that divisive too. Yeah, it was really interesting. But I was really... It was one of those events that that was a really funny thing because I remember before um, they were very adamant or like, don't talk about Donald Trump at all. And it was a weird like thing of like, nobody ever says anything, <laughs> like that. especially then it was such a weird thing to be asked. And this wasn't actually um, it, it wasn't that recently. It was probably like 2017 or 2018, yeah. something like that. Yeah, that and, was uh, um, was that was that for David Lynch? Yeah, it was for the what David Lynch. Uh, it was for his um, meditation. Uh, I 
think in schools, like they were going to like start a meditation um, courses or ideas of like creating meditation in schools, something like that. And it had to do with coffee. Yeah. It was a fun thing, but it was so weird. Well, it's weird because I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't started back up my Kennedy C, uh, center season yet, but I don't anticipate anyone tells me not to say anything about Joe Biden. It is, it is, <laughs> it was a weird time. I know it was a weird time, but, um, that's always the Kennedy center is one of those places where you're, you're sort of, it's a very, um, democratizing place in that you'll see everybody from entertainment or politics or sports. And there, that's a very, I mean, I don't know. It's a very weird thing where like, it's like a pantheon of kind of bold name, bold face name people that you'll see. It's really interesting. They have to be so apolitical that it becomes, you know, it becomes political because of who's in the audience. So it does distinguish itself from every other place I've, I've performed in in the states and in right. that way right. do, do you do you do um most of the people that do the david lynch things do transcendental meditation is that something you you do i do a lot of um not not tm but uh just meditation in general although i'm never as just like M. yeah it's tm is much more of a structured thing sometimes instead of uh meditating i'll just vacuum i'll vacuum like a zen garden vacuum but like you know vacuum all over for hours it's very to me that's very meditative so do you have any theories on uh on your own creativity or in creativity in general or do you just do what you do and try not to analyze these things i try to uh sometimes if i get stuck I'll do something a little bit differently or like I found that my attention has waned. Like I've been really into TikTok and because of that, my attention span has shortened to like 15 seconds, 60 seconds, three minutes. Like it's very like in blocks. And so I realized that I needed to go back and watch like William Wyler films or watch like you know, um, Magnific Magnificent Ambersons, like watch these like old films. Like um, I watched last night, I watched uh, Best Years of Our Lives, which is a William Wyler film um, about the return home from World War II. And it's a very, it's a very big, big movie. Um, so if I can watch like a, like a movie like that, or I went on a Deborah Carr um, crazy rampage where I saw every Deborah Carr movie from like Black Narcissus on. So if I can watch these like movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s, that will rectify my attention span. So I think creativity is often, for me, locked in with spans of attention. Mm -hmm. And if I can hold my attention with a creative project for a long time, then I'm better off. So when my attention span gets shorter, that's when I think I lose some element of creativity because I lose my patience. Well, I haven't thought about this before, but I, ma I imagine that um, because comedy can be sort of, you know, divided up into jokes and punchlines, not everyone works that way, but it can be uh, that way, that TikTok, social media in general, would, would tend to be an amazing place to just fire things off. But what hadn't occurred to me before is the effect that that might have in your general way of thinking of of your art. Mm -hmm. uh, have, you, have, have you found that over this over this period of, of um, you know over the period that we've had social media, which has been like now fucking thirty years, uh -huh. um, that your your way of writing has become shorter, or that you tend to go shorter? I think so, and I think well, stand up comedy is in general like. You want to think about about something in joke form, and then that can be very short. But uh, TikTok is a good format because it allows you to put forth a concise idea, like a standalone idea that is, um, you know, it's almost like um, radio, like pop songs on the radio. It's like it's got to be like three minutes. You know, that's as long as you can go on TikTok. So it's like got to be usually less than that. And so... What you're also doing is you're introducing yourself to an audience that may have no idea of your other work. 
So you want to sort of bring forth a, a snippet of what you do, but I have sort of carved my own lane in TikTok also because everybody is so young on there. I mean, it's really uh, for teenagers and they're doing their dances and stuff. And so I have um, my own lane that I forged where I do maybe uh, 60 second stories about the 90s. And that's to me really fun. And, and it's almost like a historical minute for a lot of people. To me, it's just like yesterday, but it's very historical. Uh, it's got historical relevance for a lot of kids who weren't even born then. So I think it's, it's really interesting. Um, I feel like technology and engaging in this new technology keeps me young or young minded. And I'd like to stay that way. I'd like to stay sort of youthful. And I think rock and roll is all about that too. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, but I've, I've liked over, you know, like I say, it's been 30 years. So it's like we're talking about it like I tend to talk about it like it's new <clears throat> and, it, and it's not. But I was always kind of into, as a writer, um, Twitter, for instance, I like having to consider. I didn't like it when they added more words or characters to it. Mm -hmm. I like keeping that kind of stuff short because for that moment, it really makes you think about your word economy. And when you're writing a song, it really is. I mean, you don't have much real estate to work in. Right. You know, you're doing a lot of repeating and stuff. So it, it, it does make sense to keep your brain um, focused on, on, on economy. I dig mm -hmm. that. I like it. Mm -hmm. And most people don't work well in it, which I think is interesting too. Yeah, it's really good. Like the, um, the structures of um, words, like the, the, economy that you have to approach a song or a joke or these kinds of social media constructs are really, I think they're effective in igniting a kind of creativity, which is really important. What do you think about comedians who like, I mean, someone like, I, I remember doing a thing with Jeff Garland over at Largo and he seemed to just, I don't know if this is true, but he seemed to walk on stage with nothing and just make shit up. Right. I think it's like a very, yeah, it's a very, that to me, some people love to do that, but he has like a, you know, a strong improv background. He's from Chicago. He's from that school of like second city. Let's see where this goes. Like the groundlings, let's see where this goes. And they can create a lot from what's happening. I, I don't feel safe doing that. Like I, I definitely like before I go out and perform, I need to know exactly what's going to happen in the beginning and the end. I don't necessarily need to know the middle. <laughs> oh, that interesting. Can, that do can you, create do you create? Do you create, in your writing, do you create a sort of a, a soft in the center question mark where anything yes. might go? Or, or, yes. or is it just more mental that you, you begin to allow it more? I allow it more. Like I'll allow like a beginning point and an end point, and then I'll allow for the middle to kind of come in. And usually that's where the magic is because you're forced to think of something. That's the way that um, Bill Hicks would uh, sort of advise that we go about it is that you, um, I worked with Bill Hicks at the very beginning of my career. And so he would always say like, just, you have your material, you know what you're going to do, you know what you're going to start off with and then just let it go and then see. And then when you need to go back to what you had planned, but let that be there just in case you need it. You don't have to always rely on what you've written beforehand to take out there. That that can be sort of like created there. And so usually like the greats who you would say like would be Sam Kinison or Richard Pryor, you would see their set like on a Monday and it would sort of take form over the week. So you would see the same material over several days and then you would see it actually form kind of um, like Michelangelo digging David out of the marble. Like he's already there but you've got to like sort of erase all the other parts that aren't him. So I think that's what good material is. Some of the, some of the improv then becomes develops and, 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 and actually becomes material probably I would imagine. Yeah. Because it's already there. It's just like easing away all of the things that are not that. You know, I only recently sort of, I guess, re realized and appreciated how much writing stand-up comedy is. Mm -hmm. what, what's, what's your process before you go on to, I mean, I can go out and play old shit 
And that's okay. It's acceptable for a musician to do that. I mean, I need to add something new too, but I feel like with a comedian, you've got a lot more pressure on you about, about you know, the, 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 the shelf life of, of your material. You do, but then you also uh, can revert back to old ideas. I think that uh, essentially comedians all have like one joke one elemental joke and that every joke you tell is through that filter. Like my elemental joke is I'm not supposed to be here, but I am here. And so everything that I do is really that, whether it's um, impressions of my mother, whether it's talking about being Korean American, whether it's race, whether it's gayness, whether it's uh, feminism, whether it's um, my progressive politics, But those kinds of subjects all go through the filter of I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. Like, if you look at every comedian, I think every comedian has the elemental joke. Um, I think that Richard Pryor also had the same kind of joke. I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. Because he was a black man talking to mostly white audiences, mostly rich white audiences, about his point of view. So. There's like a few different examples of that. Most like outsider comedians are really that. Um, I'm not supposed to be here, but I am. Even somebody like, Mm. um, you know, that seems like would be um, elementally like establishment. Somebody like Milton Berle (laughs) is very much like, I'm not supposed to be here. I am because he was kind of like crass and he was Uh, uh, was in drag and he was. Oh, that's interesting. Clouding these social conventions. Yeah, it makes me think. I'm, and now I'm running all these comedians through my head, like classic ones. I'm thinking, well, Rodney Dangerfield, with his constant "I get no respect," is almost right. like an undertone of, even though there's no reason to think that he shouldn't be there, he's <laughs> he's um, almost making one up. Right. He's creating this thing of like, uh, my thing is like, I should be respected, but I'm not respected. Like, I should be this, but I'm not. Or Joan Rivers is, can we talk? Her classic catchphrase is, let's get rid of all of the artifice of society and let's get down to what's really happening. So that's really, I think, elemental. Well, what about like Jerry Seinfeld? What's he? Jerry Seinfeld's elemental joke is, is it me? Am I seeing this wrong or is it society seeing this wrong? Like, is it me? Like, what is wrong with my perspective? that I see the truth of what's happening. Jerry Seinfeld's really about boiling it down to the truth of the situation. Like I'm seeing the subtitles of this. Am I wrong? So he's, uh, he's asking the audience for clarification of whether something is true or not, or if he is like only privy to the truth. That's super interesting to me. And it makes me reflect on my music career, my, and my, my band when we started off, because I, Sort of had this in the back of my mind that there, at the time there were every everyone in rock music fit in so well that they were they were hugely popular. Like anyone that was a rock star that I grew up with was like, yeah, I got hairy chest and a big dick and sunglasses and a guitar. <laughs> I'm fuck you. Like and that was that they were perfect. Like there's they yeah. never admit anything wrong. And in my era there were. Some of us, it became a, a, a trend of, well, I'm just kind of a, I'm just kind of a fucking dork. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so that became our sort of almost comedy shtick. Like, I can think of so many right. at the same exact time who were very popular, like Weezer. Like, that's, mm-hmm. that's even the name. Like, that's, that's like, we're so uncool, we're cool. But beneath it is kind of nine out of 10 people think that they don't fit in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge audience. It's a very, it's a, it's a very universal feeling. I mean, I think what you really bring to music is musicianship. Like your class of musicians are bringing in actually like being able to play your instruments and be good at it. Like that's a very, that was a quite a new idea in music when you were starting, I think. Well, it was, it was, um, it was something to be self self self-conscious of. I mean, any, any cool band would just be like, Jesus Christ, dude, but how about just three chords or two? And and if you had a broader vocabulary than that, then you're kinda kinda out. I but I, you know, I think you can always find you can always find a way to insist 
on on being yourself and and um mm-hmm. and you know I guess we we worked that out but I never thought of like uh, a of a comedian or a musician as having sort of almost a a single joke or a song or a mission statement that's beneath it all like what you're saying I don't belong here but yes. what, what about what about like Dave Chappelle what what would his his is you can't tell me you can't tell me what I can't say. His entire right. life. And you think that's been that for years? Forever. Or that's more recent? No, that's forever. That's if you look back at all of his material, is basically the same idea of you can't tell me uh, what are I what I can't say. Like I will not be allowed to be contained. I won't be contained. Yeah. Um, how about, and I'll stop with this and we move on, but I, I'm just fascinated with what Norm Macdonald. I never saw any Norm Macdonald. I'm just really disconnected with, I don't watch TV or anything. So I just don't know about these things. But so when he died, I looked into him and uh, I find him fascinating. What, what, what's his, what's Norm's superpower? I think that he, uh, he was just, he, he was something like, his, I think he sort of figure it's like, he was like really um, almost uh, the normality is perverse. Like I seem normal. Like his name is Norm, Norm McDonald, the most normal. But he was a weird fucking guy. Like his comedy was weird. He was a weirdo. He's a weird person. <laughs> Loved like just the perverse but he came forth like he was, um, uh, you know, like a 50, like Wally Cleaver, like a 50s Midwestern father. But he's like Canadian. He's off. Like it was sort of like I'm off in every way that you can't like it was almost like um, the definition of surreal. Somebody like that could come from a David Lynch landscape because he's sort of right. like apple pie. He's sort of like. That very Midwestern, very sort of Americana feel, but so strange. And um, with a strange point of view, strange way of thinking, it it seems as similar to like Tim and Eric, like that kind of comedy that is like the new surreal, which I think is like the new Dada um, of him or like Norm MacDonald. Or not Norm, Norm MacDonald is kind of like um, Neil Hamburger. It's the, the, mm. these are guys that they were my friends, but they're also like the new surreal sort of Dada movement, like the Marcel Duchamp toilet in the art gallery, <laughs> the strangeness. Um, that's to me what uh, somebody like Norm McDonald signifies. Do you think a comedian establishes this almost like a thumbprint with, within moments of, 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 of grabbing the mic? Like, I think how so. does how how do you see that happening? That I think you come at the desire of wanting to do comedy with that intention, and that that sort of like your elemental idea brings you forth, but then the rest of your career comes about refining it, you know, and figuring out what that is, you know. And I, I think that um, artists in general, we can be led astray by different things, whether it's um, different trends or ideas or, or different trends in comedy. You may want to sort of per, per, kind of prepare yourself to be a certain type of comedian, but then realize that you're something else later on. So I think um, it's really uh, your element, your elemental joke doesn't necessarily change, but maybe your style of delivery does. Do you, do you hear uh, through your career, if you listen back, um, do you, do you ever have a, have cringe moments about, times where you feel like you've caved to, to trends or affectations to go, uh, you know, a little bit like, uh, you know, I can recognize or I could recognize at the time in the 80s when I was a kid watching someone like Neil Young put out records. I'm like, well, that guy doesn't look right with all those pink colors and and that gated drum reverb. Like, it's not, <laughs> I wish he wouldn't even try that. Mm-hmm. Um and then he went back, like he realized that's not my thing, and he got the fuck away from it. Uh, have, did, uh, do you see those things in your career at all? I think so. I mean, I think like what it is is that I noticed the pitch of my voice. Like, um, 
in the when I started in the 80s, my voice was really high and I would do comedy like up here. And my, my natural speaking voice is probably up here. But then in the 90s, I was hanging out with Janine Garofalo a lot. So then my voice, would, it was really low. And then we all went into like some kind of weird. That's yes, right. Like a, it did. <laughs> a weird thing. But then now it's high again. So you never know. Um, I don't notice like in my material whether or not um, there's a, a real shift. Um, it's just the pitch of my voice really seems to change with the times. I will always forever second guess and cringe the way it's dressed. Like a song I don't really, I meant to write that and that's done and I have no issues with, with that. But it's the recording of it. Like how much reverb is on something or, or mm. was there some sort of affectation in the way that it was dressed? Uh, mm -hmm. because I just, I feel like I don't know about that. Like, and, yeah. uh, but I, but I know about the song, so I don't like to listen back to recordings because every era has something that sneaks in that I feel like I got bullied into, into wearing, you know, uh, high heels or something that I didn't want to wear that day. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't know. My favorite, um, song of yours is Brick. Oh, uh, thank you. That's, that's, that's my, the least dressed song. Cause that's that, my, it's the most earnest, sad, like very, like as a very youthful, the kind of like that, the youthful sorrow of that is really incredible. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I keep always come back to. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That, that was, that was a blurt. That was, that was, that one was written at the very end of the album. Uh, recording and we were really just trying to get enough material to go. And as soon as I realized what I had written and that it was going to be on the record and then that it was going to be a single, I, tr I tried to stop it. Mm, mm. <laughs> but it went, but it went and I'm really mm. glad it went like um, for the reason that you, um, that, that, that you say, I didn't, didn't have a moment to, to edit it. No, sometimes those un unedited moments are really, really the best. Well, that comes back around to what I was thinking about with you because I don't detect that you have a, a, a lot of inner editing, but you must. I mean, do you, do you have, um, I mean, how, how do you even ask this? I mean, you'll talk about shit that I wouldn't even pronounce or say, you know, <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm from, I'm from the South, white guy from North Carolina, grew up in the seventies. Uh, you know, I, I just like, there's, there's work, uh, even though I don't, I don't, I'll say fuck over and over again. That's fine. But like things that feel dirty, I yeah. just, I'm still, I'm just probably not gonna. No, I think like for me, it's a long period of like, by the time it gets to something that's recorded in like stand up comedy, that it has to go through so many iterations because I perform so much. And I, uh, well, before the pandemic, I was performing like pretty much every day every day for like 35 years. And so you would go through so many iterations of something that were basically only heard by the people in the room. And then uh, you figure out the best way to say it. And then that would be recorded. And so it is edited, but it's so many performances over so many times to get to sort of exactly what you want to say. But as you're editing, I mean, there is an editing process that happens even just in your just in your mind, you know, mm -hmm. when you're writing, what what occurs to you as an idea has already been parsed off, which is which is kind of where my domestication theory comes from, which is, for instance, like like you know, writer's block. Mm. I mean, I I personally think there's no such thing. But I think it's mm -hmm. editing. You're afraid yeah. that what you're about to write is going to be as bad as it actually is going to be. And you uh -huh. can't stand the idea. We can't stand the idea of failing that badly, even by ourselves. Right. Do you, so as you're writing, most people won't write beyond that. So there is an editing process in there. Are you aware of a kind of thing that you edit out, like something that's uh, that feels either wrong or mean or unflattering to yourself? or? Yes, all of those things. And it's almost you stop it before it even starts. Like you stop it before, like you stop at sort of the origin. It's like the um, unwelcome thought of it is not possible or you're just judging it before it even comes out as a complete idea. And I think that's really, for me, what writer's block is, is 
fear is like, oh, fear of this is going to be judged unfairly or fairly, whatever. But that's really what the block is for me. Yeah. But, and I think that then one, you see, you're, you're, one of your great superpowers probably is that your blocks are probably a little different than other people's because of your upbringing and your, uh, your, your, your view. So right. things that you would say that would, that would make me blush, there's probably things that I would think or say that maybe you wouldn't be comfortable with in, in some sort of way. But what it works into your advantage for is that it's such a, um, it, it's, it's such a service. Not because you don't say things as if they're shocking. They're uh-huh. not meant to be shocking. You were just talking. Like that that thing about, uh, what was the, there was one that I laughed at so hard I was just crying. It was <laughs> Dick Training Wheels, if you remember oh. that. That uh, joke about threesomes being Dick Training Wheels. Yes. That's yes. so fucking funny to me. But you to you, it wasn't, it wasn't like, hey, I've got a shocking idea here. It was just like, hey, this is the way it is. Right. It's just like, um, to me, it's just exploring the idea of like how homophobia really informs our uh, fear of being ourselves. And so we're going to try to uh, engage in homosexuality while still being heteros- heterosexual. That's like the, the artifice of sexual. <laughs> so um, funny. <laughs> I know. Sexual identity. It's a very, it's to me, it's really, to me, it's like really surreal, but it's just breaking down like what people do in life and sort of showing how strange it is. Boy, this is a stupid question for you. Probably been asked this before. I don't know if it's answerable. What makes something funny? Like that's funny to me. I would say simply because of probably the truth in it, but the, but the level of empathy in it too. Like I find jokes that, that, that really have a lot of, of empathy for someone's. That's why shit your pants. I, I saw some guy in Canada one time do like 45 minutes on shitting your pants. And it was so fucking funny. hilarious. And not because so of the funny. doo-doo. No. It was funny because, because of your empathy for all of the people in the stories of the people who shat right. their pants. Like you're like, okay, well, we're, we're people and that happens. <laughs> It's the humanity of it. You know, it's the human frailty. That's the most funny thing. The uh, awkwardness and frailty of the body and also of um, society's ideals of who we're supposed to be. So those things juxtaposed are always really, really funny. I'm going to take your cue and get you to give us an exercise, creative exercise from Dr. Cho that we can do for this next week until the next person comes along and shoves you into irrelevance. <laughs> I think scales. I think scales on the uh, piano, scales okay. on the guitar, uh, scales on the mandolin, scales on the ukulele. Um, all are acceptable. Um, oh, what, if you, what if you're not a musician? I think it, doing scales in your uh, voice, with your voice. Okay. Everybody can use their voice to do an up and down tonal scale. Um, that's helped me. I think like whenever I sing, usually it's important to start doing scales yeah. a little time before it's definitely helpful. And it would be great if I could just do them all the time. So scales in any way. That's a technical, that is like a, you know, that it's a, it's a technically based exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see technically based exercises or technique based thinking to be creative? I think they can be because it just sort of like it's a mindless repetition that can allow for your sort of consciousness to be occupied by something so that the rest of it can be sort of free. Like when we um, kind of uh, bind ourselves into this structure that is repetitive, then your um, mind can be free. It's almost like you're resting in a way and that can kind Mm -hmm. of regenerate creativity. I've always told like musicians, especially drum drummers, sometimes flip out when they're given a solo, for instance. And you say, okay, you're going to take a solo at this point. And they flip out. They start playing every drum and everything at, at, at once. And I just realized that I always tell them to just, if, if, you're, if you're having trouble with this, just play the bass drum repetitively 
for as long as you can stand it until you actually can't stand the monotony of it and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And, I, mm-hmm. and, and I realize that the reason that I've said that is because there's a Ringo Starr solo on, I guess it's Abbey Road, that goes, uh-huh. and that's, uh, that's where that came from. <laughs> so anyway, I, I digress. M- Margaret's New Week's resolution. This week we will do, what, five minutes of scales? Five minutes of scales. Whether it's your voice, mm-hmm. music, uh, uh, musical instrument, or whatever. If you don't sing yes. at all, you probably need to you know, go to YouTube and hear what a major scale is, but you'll know it's do, ra, yeah. re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Yes, and then down. And then we do that for five minutes and that's it. And now we've got a question from someone who's in voicemail land. Hey, I had a question for Ben and Margaret. Both of you do a lot of creative things in different fields. You know, for both of you, what comes first, the idea or the execution of that idea? Do you have a thought and make a song or a joke or, or work backwards? Or do you have a spark and it results in a song or something like that? Thank you very much. Well, that's a good question because I was actually, it's one of the things I was going to ask Margaret about, which had to do with, um, does, the, does the need to say something, to express something specifically happen first? Or do you have a marker that you follow like, well, I don't know, it just makes me laugh. Like for me, sometimes a note just makes me sad or happy. I don't know why. I'm not trying to say anything. I don't have a song that I want to write about a certain thing sometimes. I just follow the abstract. And then I realize that I've been interpreted dancing. Like, like, like say, a, a kindergartner that is, um, you know, is drawing like a, a witch and there's rain on, on, on a doggy next to the witch and they realize that the witch is the mean teacher and, and they're sad and there's rain. And, you know, like a and they're in their interpretive dancing, really their feelings, but they're not going, well, I would like to, I would like to make an artistic piece now to describe how this woman has been abusing me at school and why I'm sad and I have to call her a witch. Uh, anyway, so uh, do, what, how, how do you, um, thanks for asking that question. Cause I was going to ask Margaret that, but didn't know how to phrase it. I think it's both ways. I think it's sometimes things come out fully formed and that you almost don't have to do any work on it in a sense. And then sometimes things can come like a reverse, like, oh, I have to write something about this particular subject. Let me figure out what's funny about that. So it's both ways. You know, there's both like points of entry and it can kind of be in the middle. Like I have, or if you're like writing a song, it can be like the chorus is something, the verse is something, like then there are two ideas that are married. Um, sometimes it's just a bridge. You know, an outlet like your podcast where you're very specifically like, you know, talking about hate crimes and, and uh, the things that you might be able to joke about. Do you find that outlet is blocks you from, <laughs> from working hard to find a joke in these things in order to express it or, or to express it through your comedy? Or do you feel like, no, the best way to do this is just to just take all the all all of the all all of the career out of it and just speak about it. Does that make sense? I think to you? both. I think it's both. Like you know, I, I end up on my podcast talking a lot to Asian American comedians about these um, hate crimes against Asian Americans, and so it ends up that we have to laugh about it in a way, not laughing at the situation or laughing at the crime or any of that. It's more laughing about our own ignorance about something or that we didn't know. Or that something like this is happening. So there's um, also this laughter to cope with the pain of it. You know, that it's a horrible situation. So sometimes when you're in deep, difficult situations, you have to laugh to alleviate the pain of it. And also learning about the historical context of Asian American hate crimes, which is the, the whole thing of my podcast, is we go back in time and look at things that happened in history that we had no idea about. So... There's a like there's a lot of different points of where we can bring humor into it, but that's not the primary focus. The primary focus is to understand these stories that happened that we didn't know. Well, I think I'm out of questions. That was Thank pretty you. good. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take care of yourself, and uh, we'll see you out there somewhere. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was the great Margaret Cho. Thank you.
Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you oh so much for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.